mean, you suggested if we had a suggestion to bring it to you at this meeting. So I have done that. The third sheet is of the following, the staff members who we recognize at the beginning of the school year for the five increments of five years of service. We had three changes, as you'll see in red, where Lisa Derman and Miriam Harrington had been added to the five-year list, and Andrea Kayer has been moved from 30 years to 35 years. Uh, you'll also find a summary that I received from the nurses about uh, vaccination, and I'll talk about that when it comes to my time to do that. Would you also, on your agenda, which is in front of you, if you go to page three of that agenda, under what would be New Business 7F, would you change that from consideration to approve emergency preparedness document to consideration to approve adding to the Latin position levels two and three for 30 minutes, four days per week. So that will be the one Jeff will talk about when we get to that. And the other change that I will have is in the communications, which is number six. Would you add to that H, emergency preparedness? And Kathy will speak to that since she is serving on the emergency preparedness board. Any questions on those changes before I move, before uh, Rebecca moves ahead? Okay, thank you. Okay, bear with me one minute. I'm to look at these. Approval of uh, school board minutes. Do I have a motion for the meeting on Tuesday, August 24th, 2010? I move that we approve the school board minutes from Tuesday, August 24th, 2010, as written. Thank second. you, John. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Mary. Any discussion? Questions? All those in favor? David, are you? Are you in favor? I wasn't there. So oh, sorry. Okay. Um, so all of those opposed? All those abstaining? Thank you. Um, do you have a motion for the special meeting Tuesday, September 7th, 2010? I move that we approve these uh, minutes from the special meeting Tuesday, September 7th, 2010, as written. Thank you, John. Is there a second? Thank you, David. Any discussion, questions? All those in favor? Okay, se seven zero. Um, uh, I think it says that I was absent, but I was there. I was absent. Oh. So someone in town was absent, but someone was there. Maybe that was one. Okay, so. So you weren't there. I was not there. So David, you were. Correct. Okay. So this vote would have been six zero. I think. I, David, it has you as present. It has Mary absent. Oh. No, it's just at the. I see. It, David was absent yeah, at, at the adjournment yeah. of the yep. meeting. So the, the minutes are correct, David. Oh, yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, you had left before oh, okay. the adjournment. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Comments by student representatives. Hi, I'm Maisie Perkins. And my name is Mo Valley. We are seventh graders here to inform you about recent activities going on at the Cape Elizabeth Middle School. We have over 10 new students this year from places such as Texas, Boston, and Italy. Over the summer, we, are, we were very pleased to have 150 people show up to the new family orientation. Parents were introduced to staff while the kids were given a tour of the school and a question and answer session. Families were very delighted by the warm welcome Kate staff had to offer. We have major additions to our staff this year, such as the librarian, Mrs. Kozaka, the nurse, Mrs. Andrews, the band teacher, Mrs. Ramsey, 
sixth grade teacher Mrs. Renner, and eighth grade teacher Mr. Burke. Students have enjoyed seeing these new faces in their daily routine. Last week, we had a seventh and eighth grade open house. Parents were thrilled by the teacher's desire of their children's success. After being introduced to the new staff and the class expectations, parents followed their children's schedules, meeting the teachers and the class criteria. This is the first week 7th and 8th graders will both have their laptops for class. 7th grade parents must attend an informational meeting this Thursday. Kids will not be able to take their computers home till October. 5th and 6th grade open house will be this Wednesday. Parents are excited to meet their children's teachers. Parents will be following the same routine as the 6th and 7th grade. Fall sports officially started last week. Games started this week. School sports numbers are similar to last year, but a little more participation this year. Both 7th and 8th grade teams combined have 28 girls playing field hockey, 29 boys playing soccer, 43 girls playing soccer, 13 tennis players, and 14 cross-country runners. Over the summer, the school was informed with very pleasant news that 93% of the former 8th graders met or succeeded the science portion of the MEAs. Many families have been following the new CEMS blog. Some things that the blog covers are box tops for education, student work slash activities, the new gift wrapping program that now includes jewelry and tasty treats. This year, CEMS is working hard on putting the school's year goals to use. One, academics. Students will be assessed in various ways. They will be taking the NWAs this fall and again in May. Also in March, they will be doing the kneecap math, reading, and science and writing portion, and the science portion of the MEAs. Two, climate. Middle school students will provide baseline data through the Center of Aspirations with regard to school climate. We want to make sure all CEMS students feel comfortable in the school. Evaluating of supporting resources. All supporting resources will be analyzed for potential positive impact on students' learning and development of mid-age teens. Middle school staff will review all changes and deliver their findings at the school board meeting in 2011, January 2011. Thank you very much. Any questions? Very nicely done. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. High school? All right. Um, not a whole lot to report. Today marks the second week that we've been in school. Overall, I'd say it's been a pretty smooth start. Um, beginning of the Fresh Links program, which is the freshman mentoring program at high school, has been pretty successful so far. I know a lot of kids have already made some inroads, which is nice to see because we've been looking to create the program for a couple of years now. As far as sports go, they've been full swing for about a month now, and so far a lot of success across every sport. And that's about it to report so far. And Reed, I'd like to officially welcome you on the board. Thank you. Um, uh, well, school's been getting the swing of things. Uh, it's another exciting academic year, it appears. Um, one important aspect, I think, especially for the seniors, is the, the start of the fall senior seminar program, which has really been important in kind of introducing us into the college process and kind of taking away that anxiety. So uh, it's been one kind of helpful thing for Matt and I. So. Great. Thank you. Any questions? Great. And Matt, welcome back. <laughs> okay. Um, are there any comments from the public on agenda items? Okay. Alan, moving on to recognition. Yes. Uh, you have in your packet the recognition form, which was used this year uh, for many years now. What we have done is honor staff who have been here in, in increments of five years beginning with those who came five years ago, they're moving to 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, and this year, after correction, we have someone who's been here for 35 years. Uh, that whole list is a fairly long list. Uh, unless you uh, prefer, I won't read it all to you, but it will be sure that it is in the minutes of the board meeting. Uh, these people are all honored on our uh, first day of staff development, which is the 31st of August. And several, several of them, the 35-year, 30-year, and 25-year, uh, and I think 20-year, received gifts uh, from the school department and from you in honor of their time here in the system. 
Okay, great. Uh, next, the um, CIF awards. If, for those of you who were there the first month, uh, the 20, 31st, excuse me, uh, CIF was also there, and what they did was present their two very important awards. First, the Brownell Award, which goes to a staff member who has really shown leadership in seeking grants that help uh, in, enhance the education of our students. And the second one is the Tim Thompson Award, which obviously is in honor of Tim Thompson, who uh, passed away several years ago, and in honor of somebody who really champions uh, students. This year, the Brownell Award went to Gretchen McNulty, who has done an enormous amount of work with our students as far as uh, international uh, groups and also within the social studies program. She was extremely pleased, uh, had a real hard time to say thank you without crying, mm -hmm. but she did a great job. John Casey received the Tim Thompson Award. Uh, I would say to you that that was a, uh, a great honor for John, also a very difficult day as he acknowledged that award and uh, what it meant to him both because of his relationship with Tim Thompson and also because of his own son who passed away a year ago. Uh, it, was a, it was a very meaningful morning. Uh, I think brought a lot of tears to people, but also a lot of joy to see these two people honored as they were. I believe, I think I'm right, this is I think the fourth year, and maybe it may be the third, I can't remember for sure, but anyways, either the third or fourth year that we've done this. And uh, it is certainly a nice award, recognizing the fact that each of them receives a crystal apple and also $2,000 to use either in their classroom or as they see fit in the process. So it was uh, very well done, and I thank CIF uh, for doing this. I think it's a, an extremely important piece of the work they do, an extremely important piece to honor these people who work in Cape Elizabeth who do some wonderful things for students. Thank you, Alan. Okay, under communications, principal's update on school opening. <laughs> uh, I'll start, Tom, uh, as far as Pond Cove is concerned. Good evening, nice to see everyone back to work again. Not surprisingly, Pond Cove, uh, despite the heat, started out very well, but I want to backtrack a little bit and mention some of the things that make the opening of school so easy for people. It really begins in late June when the school empties out and becomes a building again. I want to thank Janet, who then passed the baton on to Greg for all the hard work that the maintenance and custodial crew did. They really worked hard this summer. Also, a little under the radar, a lot of curriculum work happened over the summer. Um, curriculum content groups met with their flex time or recertification credit, and right after school, um, ended the literacy task force spent with our outside facilitators and we got a lot of work done on that day and then a subgroup met again in august to get that done which set us up very well for the professional development that started the day um, and traditionally people come in and out actually it was so rainless this summer that teachers had a hard time scheduling their work days to come in but they managed to come in on sunny days on their own time and set up their classrooms every staff member really worked hard to get that done we had as usual our great family support if you were there on opening day on pond cove i think it was about 95 degrees not just the pond cove but all over the parents were um, loaning fans to classrooms uh, day um, all day long the kindergarten students, as you probably know, do not start on the same day as everybody else. They have an orientation session. With, they ride the bus with their families and spend 20 to 30 minutes with the kindergarten teachers, and that worked very well. So on the big day itself, our new uh, guidance person, Bree Gallagher, our, I'll say, regular ed uh, social worker, Patty Blankenship, were both around. They had met with me and staff people over the summer really worked hard again in their own time to get the lay of the land and they were able to deal with expected and some unexpected separation issues that always occur and on the numbers front en en enrollment is just about where we expect it to be it's almost exactly 600 we've had some kids leave some kids come in and we're making an extra effort to make uh, kids who joined Pond Cove a little later in their career especially welcome the internal committees have started, um, team leaders, SST has met, and we had our first climate committee meeting just last week, and it occurred to me that we used to have a school board member on that committee. So if you, we'd love to have a school board member again on that committee. If you want to find out more, just let me know, and I'll tell you what it involves. 
So great start as usual. Thank you everybody for making it possible. We don't have any sports teams to talk about. <laughs> I, would, I would like to, Tom made me think of a couple of things though. Number one, I'd like to mention his staff. They, so many of them came in this summer, and you're right, during very hot weather, to do curriculum planning. Yeah. Uh, as they did at the middle school and at the high school. But I think that's extremely important that our money has been spent wisely yeah. in the process of curriculum planning. And Tom just made me think of something else that I want to be sure to say. If you look at the statistics for population of students, we have 1,703 students the first week of school. You remember we were talking about it could be down to about 1,680. And we have stayed basically where we were last year. And uh, which makes me feel very good to know that we have that number of students here. We have had several new students move in uh, from, several, uh, from a couple of uh, foreign countries as well as locally. Uh, and so our population has stayed right up there, which pleases me to know. Yep. Thank you, Tony. Yep. Uh, Steve, I don't know if you got much to report. Your kids have reported most of it for you. <laughs> um, I'd echo what Tom said about the work that was done this summer in the building. Uh, the middle school in Pong Cove custodial staff left, this, left this, our site at one point during the summer in early August and went down to the high school and worked as a team with that group um, to get that school ready to go and came back and finished off just at the last minute with the uh, middle school portion of the building. We had quite a bit of professional development. I saw a, a lot of teachers this summer and we are working on continuing the curriculum instruction and assessment work from last year. Groups are at different phases and different iterations. Uh, some groups are preparing for school board presentations and documentation. Other groups are, are past that point and they're working on their common assessments. So that work is going well. We just had our first Monday meeting of the year yesterday uh, across the district. Um, we have a staff meeting coming up next week and we're looking at some other kinds of goals to set for ourselves. And thinking of goals, we have, if you check out the school blog, there's a listing there, but it talks about how we're continuing to focus on writing. This will be an interesting round with the kneecaps that happened between August 1st, uh, October 1st and October 22nd, because it will include a writing score. Since 2006, there have not been any external data points for main schools to use. We haven't had the NEAs. They were either the scores were thrown out in writing or it was a calibration year or they decided not to take those score or not to do that test in another year. Um, and then with the kneecaps this past year, they were a calibration year. We're done calibrating. We're good. We're good. We're set. So um, we, had, we have quite a bit of work. We're con continuing our focus on writing for portfolios, the depth and breadth of writing the kids are doing. We're also working towards uh, common goals with the other schools around uh, the school climate and around um, academics, the curriculum instruction and assessment pieces, and also about supporting resources and doing an evaluation of those by uh, hopefully January, as the young ladies mentioned. Sports teams are off to a roll. The place is looking good. Kids are quite kind of copacetic. It's, it's been a really interesting start. Every Most mornings I try to get out there and say hello and, and uh, kids are just rolling right along. I think they had a good break. Steve, can you just um, briefly, I, I don't want to get too far into it, but I just noticed um, uh, because my kids are sixth graders, that the social studies curriculum for the first trimester is including something new, which is around that informational text it's, uh, it's about the, the nonfiction informational text because we noticed um, through starting in the spring two and a half years ago with the NWEAs, the first time we took the, the round of those, we noticed that our kids have uh, score substantially above the national average. And we're pleased by that statistic. But then when, when we look at the data, it says it also says repeatedly that our students were not failing, faring as well with non uh, uh, with informational text, nonfiction. So there were a couple of things that have happened around that. One would, of course, be the the fact that we didn't really have a textbook account, and those weren't uh, those weren't in use, or if they were in use, it was very sporadic. So now we have resources that are in the school for the students to use, 
And the other piece is that in the fifth and sixth grade, we're continuing a tool that's been used in the, Tom, is it third and fourth grade? Uh, uh, fourth grade, okay, fourth grade with the comprehension toolkit. So this, this looks at eight different strategies for helping kids become more uh, aware of what they're thinking about, what they should be looking for when comprehending text. Um, we're also working with kids in the literacy side of that, specifically on uh, fluency rates, looking for assessments that will help us out. But um, So kids are going to spend the first trimester in, when they're doing a lot of reading on, on nonfiction works related to the social studies. The teachers in those social studies classes are focusing on the reading comprehension aspects. So we're, we look at it as though we're double dipping. Okay, we're, increasing so the re we're actually doubling our literacy time. Okay, and but that, that toolkit work is going to be in conjunction with social studies. The social students. studies, it's no. the vehicle. They're going to be getting social studies content, but we're doing that social studies content for a whole different purpose. Okay, great. That's, one, that's great, thank you. We're over. Any thank questions? you, Steve. Jeff. I guess I would say I think we've gotten off. I've been really pleased with the start that we've had uh, at school. Um, I will say for future reference, because I will remember it if I say it, and perhaps, perhaps the, the vast majority of feedback from the staff was that the three faculty days before school featuring an unscheduled day that first day was provided a great start to the school day because what it did in terms of the dynamics of the school is teachers got away a lot of the anxiety that typically happens when we have those meet those days that feature lots of meetings very often teachers are there thinking about the rosters setting up their rooms getting their texts ready and the last thing they want to do is be able to sit through meetings we actually had some really good meetings um, and it was largely because of the way the calendar was set up so it was really good um, I wanted to explain Matt's reference to Fresh Links because I think if, if board members have high school students, you may be aware of what Fresh Links is, um, but if you don't, you may not be. Basically, the idea is, um, and it's, it's really a collaborative effort of the High School Parents Association, who has put a lot of time into it, um, and Troy Henninger, who's sort of the point person within the school. And basically what it is, is that every single ninth grader has an older student, an 11th or 12th grader, who is uh, a fresh link to them. And basically that, that's short for freshman link. And basically the way the program has worked is very simple. The responsibility of the older students is periodically, once a month, I'm not sure exactly what Troy has planned or so, um, or at least once a month or so, the older student will find the younger student, which has been an interesting process in and of itself to get to know the kids. There have been some false starts and several kids have been <laughs> introduced by fresh, several freshlings because they're misidentifying who their kids are, which is kind of a friendly way to begin the year. Um, but basically, it's, you, the, the older student um, has agreed, has volunteered, these are all volunteers, to go up, say hi to the student, ask how things are going in a very friendly way. Um, if there's any suggestion that there are some issues to help the student find a way, a channel, an adult channel to send those issues to, and if there's not, to say have a great, have a great week, have a great day, have a great whatever. Um, so that's really the effort, is to try to do a little thing, but a sustainable thing and a simple thing, uh, to try to help address some of those climate issues and to make ninth graders feel very welcome. Um, the thing that I am personally most excited about about the start of the school year is a wonderful collaborative uh, that the math teachers have worked out with the Achievement Center. Um, through some creative scheduling, we now are able to have a math teacher in the Achievement Center every single period of the day. Um, and what that's, so every single math teacher in um, uh, algebra, geometry, advanced algebra, and I think FST as well, has given a pre-assessment to students on skills that the teachers have identified as being really important to success in that particular class. Um, and the teachers have commonly scored those assessments. 
um, and where the students are falling short on certain skills, they are being required to go to the Achievement Center uh, to get some assistance from the math teachers who are there. And the math department has actually come up with some worksheets to sort of support that. So the Achievement Center has been an absolute buzz of activity. It has been overflowing uh, with students from honors to AP to CP, everything. I mean, just literally everybody has gone. Um, and it's just a really great way to have started the year. Um, and really what it is, it's the most tangible example thus far of what a real push in a high school to say, you know, that these kids are not just the kids of the teachers in the class, they are everybody's kids. So how can the teachers work together effectively to support the students? Um, that's going to be a, a, a major thrust this year. It's a, it was a major thrust of our conversation with staff on Tuesday. Um, and I'll talk about that in more detail at, at some point. Um, we also featured a writing assessment uh, that for all students that we're trying to focus on some of those core mission statements of academic expectations. So we had a common writing assessment that the English department sponsored and is going to be scored. Um, the English department has also done common grammar assessments. They may well do something through the Achievement Center as well, similar to what the math department did to try to shore up some of those conventions uh, skills. Um, in a couple of weeks, we're going to be doing a reading assessment. In a couple of weeks after that, we're going to be doing a research assessment. Um, and teachers have been working very collaboratively together. And Matt is looking forward to that already, I can, I can tell. Um, I was actually looking at what's been drafted so far. And uh, there's some questions there I can't answer right now. So we're taking a look at that. Um, trying to read my, oh, school board. Um, I sent to Alan just yesterday, so it probably hasn't gotten out to school board members yet. Last year, the, school, the student government, which is the SAC, reorganized itself, reinvented itself. So now there are three standing committees. Um, there's a climate committee, uh, a policy committee, and a curricular slash extracurricular committee. Um, and the extracurricular committee was actually very helpful in the spring. They created a brochure that was that we ha about extracurricular activities in the high school, which we were able to get to ninth graders on the very first day of school, uh, which was really good. But ideally, this the um, the um, SAC is inviting school a school board member, and at the very least, the student government as a whole, which I think they're calling the assembly. Um, I think that's, I can't remember, but the large body, the assembly, I, and, and on one, as many of those committees as folks would like to, the school board members can afford to take time to attend. Typically the meetings are the full assembly committee, uh, full assembly is once a month. Um, there's a schedule that's already predetermined. I can get it to you. I, um, and then the committee meetings are also once a month. And they, to, all those meetings typically happen before school. So especially if you're an early riser, um, 7.15, um, that's when those committees get going. Um, and the only other thing I would add at this point, I think there's some other agenda items later, but um, the only other thing that I would add at this point is we, we have started down the journey of trying to collect parking fees. Um, and some juniors and seniors and perhaps others, um, including perhaps some school board members, children today, <laughs> got, got a very gaudy colored um, reminder, just what, not a fine, not anything else, just a, the, a, a more formal reminder than what we've been doing so far about the $50 fees. So um, I'm sure that will generate lots of questions and discussions. Um, but that is happening. I will say I noticed that, and it's not surprising at all, more juniors are in compliance at this point than seniors. Um, and I'm not going to spend the time right now to go into why I suspect that's the case, but that's the case right now. I have a question. Yeah. Yes, Dave. Um, I think it's fascinating when you're doing with math in terms of following up with these tests and using the Achievement Center. And I would strongly encourage that you can do all these tests with these other sub areas that you use the Achievement Center in the same fashion. There's one thing they get tests and told where you're lacking, but not the follow-up to correct the lack the skills that are lacking. It's, it's sort of like a test that doesn't help you. So I, I think it's fascinating that you're doing for math. I don't know what it's capable of bringing in all these other groups, but I would 
sincerely encourage our teachers and yourselves to, to really push that. And one of the things that's different, and it does take the Achievement Center into another dimension, because up until this year, um, and student use of the Achievement Center has been entirely voluntary, essentially. Uh, sometimes it's used, there are ways that teachers entice students to go there, but it hasn't been required. With the math thing, it's the first time we've actually required students to go, because we've said it's not an option not to learn. Um, you, need, you need to know these things, and so here's a resource, and you need to take advantage of it. So I think that's been, I think that's been really good. Thank you, Jeff. Yep. Donald. Donald. Well, that's the reason why. First of all, it was, and this is my fifth year here, and this was the best start for, this, for the school system for the instructional support department. We had a great, great start. So, like all the other principals, we had an awesome start to that. Um, my, all the instructional support teachers, including special ed teachers, ELL, the strategists, worked hard to do their schedules, meeting all the individual needs. And we have a lot of individual needs, and the uh, staffing has been great. We're working on it. I, I observed a couple classes with Joni Hewitt. I wanted to bring her name up because we went from seven students in ELL to 13. And she is doing an unbelievable job and learning a lot, and she is just having a great time. Um, we had to hire a long-term sub to fit some needs in there so, so those kids can have some support in the regular classroom. Um, special Ed Department is working with new regulations. We have new regulations with main, the main special regulations. We have new regulations in main care. <coughs> New, we have all kinds of new regulations and new forms, and we're working on those, and the staff's been meeting and understanding how to deal with this, and uh, there are lots of questions, and we're implementing these. Um, our goals this year, I heard goals from some of the principals, our goals are based around the ARA and the local entitlement funds, so we have to write goals based on the money that we're using. And one of those is technology, I just wanted to show you this. So we have iPads with, in most of our functional life skills rooms where they're using great new apps free apps um, that will help students, especially with nonverbal autism, and to watch that, I've been observing that, and it's been unbelievable. Um, so it's been a great thing. This is going to a student at Pong Cove, actually, once I get the case from Gary. Um, my staff have reviewed your questions, um, and they're gearing up for the workshop in two weeks. They're very excited. Um, I'm going to be sending all of you PDF-wise, so there's nothing going to be in your inbox, lots of information that you sh probably should review before that meeting. Um, so we'll get that out to you. Also an agenda for that, kind of based on the Teaching Learning Committee. Um, the staff has picked their new book. Um, some of you know five years ago we picked a new book. This is in our professional development times. We're going to be reading Soup by Jeff Gordon, I mean John Gordon, I like to call it Jeff Gordon, but John Gordon wrote the, the bus book. So we are now reading this book. It's a great book on how to work with families, work with, it's, it's a business book, but it's an awesome book. You can look it up online. Um, let's see, also we finished our website, our new website, the instruction support website, and we're going to be using that in our workshop. So a lot of that information you can preview beforehand, um, so it's up to date, new staff, um, and all kinds of things on that. Um, and I also just want to thank Gary and the whole tech department. We have a lot of new technology. We have a lot of, as you know, a lot of individual needs. Um, and they have set up everything uh, for a lot of our students, and it's been great and great timing. So overall, great start to the year. We're very excited, and we're moving forward. So, Great. Thank you, Don. Okay. Moving on to Susan, Susan Dana, Safe Passages in the Professional Development Trip to Spain. I, I got my, uh, it's our team shirt, Kate Elizabeth, the, actually uh, designed by a student, I'm going to put this here, because I'm going to, two hats here, one is going to be a safe passage and one is about a personal professional development um, program, but I think it was about 18 months ago that Janet Hosker and I were here and we um, approached the board about taking a group of students to Guatemala and um, we had your stamp of approval, so I'm just reporting back, we did go in June of 2010, just about two months ago. And um, it was just an amazing team. And I just really wanted to come in front of the board and just talk about these, uh, these, teams, uh, these teams and the team that went down because um, I just think it's a great way to start the school year because uh, 
teens in the often, or I talk a lot about stereotypes in my classroom in terms of global awareness, but I think also, and I always used to start out with teenagers, is, you know, what, what's a stereotype of a teen? When you go off on a team from Cape Elizabeth and you're playing in Gorm or you're playing, what, what, what are some stereotypes about Cape students or just about teenagers in general? But um, I'm just so impressed with the teens that we have in the community. I was just so, so proud of our teens. We had just so many thanks from, from Safe Passage. Um, we met once a month all last year. Uh, there were two main things. One was fundraising. They had to, uh, the goal was to raise $6,000 in cash to donate to Safe Passage. And they also raised another $1,000 to purchase material goods to actually donate to Safe Passage. In addition to this, they paid for the trip, for their airfare and the lodging and some parent, whatever. They, so some of them earned money on their own to pay, pay for their trip. Um, so we met once a month. They came up with two projects. We first had to meet with, uh, brainstorm some ideas. But the two projects we divided into two teams. and. One project was um, to teach playground games to the children in Safe Passage. Um, I'm assuming everyone knows what Safe Passage is. I don't want to spend too much mm -hmm. time, but um, it's, it's working with children whose families work in the um, Guatemala City dump, very impoverished um, children. We don't stay in Guatemala City. We stay in Antigua, which is up in the highlands of Guatemala. It's about an hour away, so we, it's an hour drive in every morning, about an hour and a half back with fresh hour traffic into Mexico City and four or five lanes coming into the city. It's a huge, it's a capital city, so big city. Um, so the other project they did was a, called a Soy Yo booklet, which the team did in actually 2007, but where they would sit down with students, um, elementary students, and interview them and ask, you know, how old are you, what's your favorite color, um, et cetera, et cetera, interview them in Spanish, and then they would, uh, the Cape students would actually write down what the uh, Safe Passage student said, and then it's, um, then they make a booklet out of it and decorate the booklet, and then the children are able to read back. It was just a great literacy project, and it was great for our students to be speaking Spanish. Of course, about a month beforehand, we found out they were going to be doing the Soyo booklet with 15 and 16-year-olds, and the Cape team just panicked. <laughs> Every month, they're saying, we've got to be flexible. We're going to Latin America. We have to be flexible. They did a great job interviewing the teens, and I think it ended up being um, a really good project. But um, another thing that was interesting when we were there is, um, I don't know if you remember, Storm Agatha occurred in April and May in Guatemala. Huge mudslides, I mean, really a lot of, dev a lot of devastation. But at one point, we weren't sure if the trip if we were going to be able to make it or not. But um, So there were many, many shelter victims in Guatemala City, and so Safe Passages, a nonprofit, opened up their doors to these um, victims who had absolutely nothing. I mean, they'd lost everything. So they were just staying in shelters in the city, but they came to Safe Passage for the day to get meals and attend classes. Anyway, Safe Passage asked our team, the Cape Elizabeth team, there are other teams there, but asked our team if we would work additionally with um, these shelter victims. And it was amazing. The kids just, sure, we'll do it. And they jumped in and they did their soyo book and they did the playground games and they were really very, very successful. And um, the, uh, I know that the, uh, the, Agatha, the Storm Agatha victims were actually very um, appreciative. They all wanted to have pictures taken with our students and I thought took that as a, as a good sign. Um, in addition, we, they did a lot of, the Cape students did a lot of fundraising. I really tried to let them organize themselves as just kind of the leader there. And they did, uh, they had bottle drives, they had a clink bottle drive, a Yankee candle sale. They had a Spanish fund where I think they raised about $1,800, where they just would get pledges for speaking Spanish and um, flatbread fundraiser. So anyway, they, they did a lot. And our support team is the, um, it's the largest cash donation that, that Safe Passage has received from a high school support team ever. So, um, and then we've got all sorts of thank yous from, um, from Safe Passage. But I just, uh, I really just want to commend the high school students. I'm not going to, there are 18 of them who went. And they're still continuing. The Safe Passage Club I know just met last week. I think many of them are continuing to be involved with Safe Passage. I know there's going to be a, uh, Safe Passage is having a big uh, road race in September 25th. And the CAPE team has a website and you can make donations to it. And the, um, the winning team, actually Ben Berman has been very involved with Safe Passage, who's a student at Cape High School, and he actually volunteered in their office this summer. He's been down there four times now as a result after the first team, but um, the prize is going to be the winning high school in the greater Portland area can Skype with a, um, with a class in, in Safe Passage, which I think is amazing. And again, it just shows the students, they're not going to win a pizza party. It's not something for them. I mean, they're just so excited to be able to win this to Skype with the students in Guatemala because they've made this connection with the students. So. Um, so anyway, it was just a, a wonderful trip, and we just had so much positive feedback about our, the, the Cape students, and I think they really represented the town of Cape Elizabeth very well. Um, so just want to mention that. Also, I'd really like to thank Janet Hospital because we kind of went under the umbrella of community services, and there is no way I could have done that. It was a lot of organization to take 18 students to a developing country, and um, her office just did a great job just in terms of transportation and getting the first aid kits and everything else. So I just really want to thank Janet and her staff for um, supporting us. I just really think, I just, um, 
just think it's so important for our students in the 21st century to be making, I, I'm really, my, my new thing in the last five years is just global literacy. Um, we hear a lot about numerical literacy and, and literacy reading, but they really need to be aware of, of the whole world. I mean, it's just changed um, tremendously. It's really an exciting time, I think. I love the internet and, and these connections that we can make. But um, there was just a, in July of 2010, the US Capitol, there was a, a, a large um, policy meeting to understand the goals of global education in the United States. And just one quote, this is Robin McMahon, who actually is a teacher who's from Chapel Hill, has a program very similar to our Cape program, where they start foreign languages in elementary school, um, which are not very many, by the way, so it's great that we have a program. But she said the message was clear, this is in the U.S. Capitol, the message was clear from everyone. In order to complete in a flat, interconnected, and diverse world, it is critical that we graduate students who are competent in 21st century skills, international awareness, appreciation and knowledge of diverse cultures, proficient in at least one world language, and high-level thinking skills coupled with extensive knowledge of international issues. So I just want to end on that because I really think that these trips are just critical for our students in terms of their, their overall education. So let's Safe Passage. So let's go back to Safe Passage. Um, after Safe Passage, I came back. I, I had no idea that both of these would work out for the same summer, but I ended up going to Spain. I'm going to just put my pictures here. I don't know if they come up. But, um, the embassy has, the Spanish embassy has a program for Spanish teachers every year. It's international courses. Um, I applied in November and was accepted. There are 26 teachers from the U.S. who went to, um, we're actually in Santiago de Compostela, which is in northwestern Spain. Um, took a three-week course, all intensive course, um, in all in Spanish, we're all Spanish teachers. Uh, learning about Spain, its traditions, its customs, um, any, anything you can think of. Uh, there are 26 of us from the U.S. In total, there are 300 teachers there. There was a group from Morocco. There was a group from Brazil. Brazil has a new law where in, in 2012 where every student that graduates has to be um, fluent in Spanish um, because of Merck, which is the uh, economic group, uh, kind of like NAFTA down in southern South America. So a large contingent from Brazil. Um, there's a European contingent. People from also 300 of us total from around the world. And it was, in, in addition to the Spanish that I learned, um, it was just amazing to me to be sharing, to sit down, and we're in the dorms, they house us in these beautiful dorms, and in dorms, and I'm, I'm talking to someone from Morocco, and someone from Germany, and from Finland, and Australia, and New Zealand, and Spanish is our common language, and, you know, what are issues, how do you teach this, how do you teach colors or numbers in Spanish, or, um, it was just really, that to me, I think was more valuable than the Spanish part, was being able to connect with teachers from around the world. It was really interesting. In Morocco, their huge problem is everyone wants to take English. 80, it's said like 80% of every student in Morocco wants to take English. So they have to really market their Spanish program. So you say, well, how do you market your Spanish program or whatever? Um, I just thought that was really interesting. Um, so there were just so many things that, that, that com came back from that trip. Probably the three, three things I want to bring back to the classroom are, um, and this is a real long way, but, uh, oh, first of all, one thing I did is I visited all the Pond Cove. I, I also have to thank SEEF. I'm not following my notes. I probably should, but um, this was partially funded by a grant from SEEF, and part of my proposal was that Timoteo would go with me, and if any of you had children at, in Pond Cove, Timoteo is a stuffed animal that goes to all the classes. Well, I took a flat Timoteo with me. I visited all the third grade classes in last spring, and they came up with a scavenger hunt for me, so Timoteo went with me. I have about 300 pictures of Tim Otelo. He does have a blog, which is off my website. Um, I'm going to be going back and visiting these students who are now in fourth grade and responding to their questions about Tim Otelo. But Tim Otelo, on, on my second day of my trip, I ran into Aitor, who's this little stuffed dog. Turns out uh, the, the woman who's in my program from the U.S. This is all on the website as well. Um, Tim Otelo on Tim Otelo's blog. There's also a safe passage <laughs> blog I forgot to mention if you want to go off my webpage. Um, but Marta, who's a teacher, a Spanish professor at the University of Alaska, one of the 26 from the U.S., turns out she has 10 sled dogs, and she's involved in the Iditarod. She doesn't actually run the Iditarod, but there's a whole website called Iditarod.com. And I'm going to have my, I'm developing the unit right now, meeting with uh, Marcia Chase and Anne-Marie Dion, and um, our students are going to be blogging with a sled dog from the Iditarod. I never would have thought I'd have to go to Spain to find out about the Iditarod. But anyway, turns out that Marta, there's one dog who will blog back in Spanish. So, and it happens to be Aitor, who, this is the actual, the real Aitor, Marta's dog. So everywhere we went, Aitor and Timoteo went to the restaurants together, they went to the movies <laughs> together, I've got, as I said, 300 pictures of these. And it got to the point where I tried to hide Timoteo and other teachers, ah, don't they stop Timoteo, you've got, you know, you have to take a picture of him, so. But anyway, but it was good because now other teachers 
it, within the process, that's a great idea, I'm going to do that when I get back. So I'm trying to make a connection, I have a good friend from Brazil now who teaches Spanish, so I'm really excited about being able to develop these, these connections with the teachers that I met with Skype and, and other, other things. Um, so those are the two, um, the Iditarod and then the, the Skyping with the classroom and then also traditional games. I've been in contact just through email with schools in Galicia. This region is very much like Maine. It's, um, it's seafood and uh, dairy are their main, for a lot of tourism. So anyway, um, I'm hoping to develop, I am in the process of developing uh, an other th another thing with um, traditional games. Um, so anyway, I think I'll end here because I don't to point time. But anyway, I just want to thank, professional development was great, and I know, I have another quote, but I'm going to skip it, but I know it's really hard in these economic times where it's just really, um, it, it's just difficult right now, but I really think that we have to continually be looking ahead, and um, I really appreciate this opportunity for the um, professional development. I'd really like to thank Steve also for, the, for partially funding this uh, experience in Spain. I don't know if there are any questions, but go to the website. There's a lot more on the website. That would be your teacher website at the middle school. That would be the way they would access it. Yes, the just go to the okay, thank exactly. you. Yep, teacher websites. Thank you so much. Okay, community services. Boy, is that a tough act to follow. I don't think that's <laughs> Um, I do want to take the opportunity to just thank Susan. You can tell through her enthusiasm and her knowledge, her expertise, that she has um, put together an awesome trip for the kids. Um, not only her organization and attention to detail, but her ability to communicate and her rapport with the students have all been huge in making those trips a success. In fact, she isn't tooting her own horn in the fact that Safe Passage um, has patterned many of their policies, procedures, and programs as a result of Susan's first trip with Safe Passage a few years ago. So that a lot of the things that they do now are because of the way that she set up the, the team and the trip um, a number of years ago. And um, it's a kudos to her for everything that she's done in that trip. Um, and she did take two teams. She talks about it as one, but they normally take a team of eight. Um, and because we had such an incredible um, interest in going, um, we were able to put together two teams with uh, all the chaperones that uh, really provided a great opportunity for students. And the chaperones had an incredible time as well, from what I understand. So um, thanks to Susan for all of that. Um, the major reason for me to be here is, I think, to just uh, help everyone realize that change can be challenging and also beneficial. Um, it seems like, it, as I was preparing for both topics tonight, both um, community services and transportation, that same theme kept coming forward. Um, change can be challenging but beneficial. Um, our new brochure is out, in case you haven't seen it, thanks to Bob Harrison, who is a Cape Elizabeth resident, for sharing his beautiful photography work with us and allowing us to put it on the cover. Um, and, of course, the, we have changed now to not only the paper application, uh, paper, paper registration, but also the opportunity to register online. Um, Again, change can be challenging, but beneficial. Um, after 64 hours of training, our, our, my staff during this very hot summer, as you know, um, we did go with, live with registration at um, what was supposed to be 8 p.m. on um, Labor Day. However, uh, there was a little bit of a glitch, and it was 8, 10, 12, 14. We're not sure exactly the time. Um, but I appreciate everyone's patience in that transfer over into the online services. And just to remind all citizens that whether you choose to use um, the online services for registering or not, we would like everyone in the community who has any connection to community services to set up their own account with us so that when they come in to register, we can simply do an attach to that account. Um, it doesn't cost you anything to set up your account with us, and it just provides us with all your information. And we won't need those paper registration forms ever again. So um, that's the hope for, <laughs> for everyone. Um, and thanks for uh, the patience with us as we learn the new program and we learn how to make things work in our office. So um, that's the community services piece of things. Uh, transportation, again, change can be challenging, um, but beneficial. Um, 
as you probably have heard, I, I think it's quite the buzz in the community, uh, we did streamline our uh, bus routes. Um, we were attempting fiscal responsibility um, through streamlining the services. Uh, that included maximizing the current staff that we have and the resources as far as buses and vans, um, providing a safe timeline for our drivers to um, navigate students to and from school, um, and consolidating stops so that there are fewer of them so that the drivers can actually make those stops easier, and consistency in application of the school board policy. Um, I want to thank Pat Fowler for the work she did all summer. You talk about teachers and what they did summer, all summer. Well, Pat Fowler and the drivers worked um, all summer in trying to find what was the best series of routes and stops and safe, safest areas. We did miss some things in that process, and I appreciate those who have gone through the appeals, the transportation appeals process, which for those of you who aren't familiar, um, is a committee of um, the superintendent, uh, myself and a school board member where we actually board a bus we go out to the area that has been written a, a, an appeal um, with a driver school bus driver driving the bus of course and um, Pat Fowler who's a transportation scheduler and we evaluate the stops and the areas not only according to what's safe for students but safe for drivers um, of both the vehicles that may be passing, trying to pass the bus, the bus and how it maneuvers in and out of um, neighborhoods, and also to provide consistency for um, how kids travel to and from their bus stops. Um, we have taken on several appeals, um, and some have been approved and changed, and others have been um, kept as the original schedule came out. But those who followed the process and helped um, us understand the stops and what those looked like for the parents and the students appreciate them writing in and, and taking that process and giving um, us their feedback. Um, but again, change can be challenging and beneficial. So we're hoping that the benefits to the school district and to the town um, will win out in the end. Those are my two areas if you have any questions. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, uh, Federal Education Jobs Bill, Alan. Uh, last Tuesday, yes, last Tuesday, the board met uh, to take a look at two, situ two different issues. One is the Federal Jobs Bill funding, <coughs> and the other is Social Security numbers for students. Uh, when we did the Federal Jobs Bill, uh, we went over the process, and I'm just going to skim over it very quickly and that if there are any questions, we'll be happy to do that. We looked at the fact that we received $583,260 in uh, federal jobs bill funding. Uh, that's based on our EPS formula. In looking at it, we had to do the funding over fiscal year 2011 and 2012. And there were some very specific guidelines as far as that funding is concerned as it relates to jobs for staff. In looking at those, we, we looked at several different possibilities. For fiscal year 11, the current year, we looked at the possibility of a curtailment, which we have heard could happen this year in January or February. Uh, we talked with both Rebecca, has talked with Jim Ryer at the uh, Department of Education, and I have done the same. Uh, there's not any certainty that this will happen, but what we did do is put some money aside in case it does happen. So we put $141,612 aside for that in case it happens. What we know is if it does not happen in 10 and 11, which we hope it doesn't, that money will be transferred into the fiscal year 12 budget, recognizing the fact that the fiscal year 12 budget is going to be a very difficult budget because of the loss of federal funding, the ARRA money, and also losses at the state level. Uh, but what we did do is that we did bring in 1.5 ed tax for the instructional support staff uh, based on needs that we have at this point and also based on some decisions we made uh, during budget season and recognizing the fact that we would need these people. We also did set aside $50,000 more of course reimbursement. In the description of how you can use jobs bill money, one of the things was for reimbursement of courses. We have that built into our contract. 
in order to save positions in the last few years, I have had to cut that money back further and further and further. This year I had $50,000 in budget, have had some major requests uh, for more money, uh, and, the, and this teacher contract calls for up to nine credit hours. And so we did do that, so we put that money back in there. So that is available. So for fiscal year 11, if the curtailment does happen and with the ed tax and the course reimbursement, we have set aside $236,219. For fiscal year 12, the balance of the amount, we are very clear on the fact that salaries and benefits uh, that were paid by fiscal year uh, stimulus money uh, are going to have to be replaced. So we took the remaining money for fiscal year 12, which is $347,041, and set it aside. So that between the two years, that gives us the 583,260, with the understanding that uh, fiscal year 12 could have another 141,000 added to it if we do not have a curtailment uh, this year. Uh, for those in the, in the public who may not have heard a lot about that, in the last two years, we've had some major curtailments in funding. And they are very difficult curtailments because it comes after the budget has been set. And the uh, amount of money that we have had to cut has been fairly significant. Fortunately, we've had ARRA money to support some of that. If we had, if it had come directly from budget, it would have been catastrophic for us in many ways. So that is how we have proposed the 2011 and 2012 uh, amounts from the federal jobs bill. We did submit our grant. Uh, we submitted it on the 8th. It was due the 10th. And so it has been turned into the state with the understanding that we can make adjustments if we need to make them as, as we move along. Uh, I, I think more than anything else, this was information for the public because our last meeting was uh, televised so that you would get a chance to see that. That's right. Thank you, Alan. Um, and next will be the social, student social security reporting, which is what was also voted on at our last meeting, um, but we'll discuss it um, on camera. Okay. The same thing happened if uh, you've been reading in the newspapers over the last month. There have been several issues about Social Security numbers being requested from every student, uh, and those under 18 and those over 18. The understanding was that Social Security number would then be used by the Department of Education to follow students through their school career. So for instance, if you have a child who's in kindergarten and that number is reported, then that number will follow that student through their entire school career on to grade 16 and into their adult life. Uh, they were very clear in this that it is not absolutely necessary. Parents do not have to approve this. What we do know is over the last several years we have had a form where students register in Cape Elizabeth either as kindergartners or as new students moving into town that they give their social security number. That number cannot be released because we don't have parent signature. So what we have done in the last week is we have gone through and taken every social security number out of PowerSchool, which is our student information system. Then, as the new numbers are brought in, they are added if there has been written permission from the parent. When we talked about it the other night, the one piece that we did have to look at is there was an option. Let me go backwards for just a minute. The letter that we sent, and it has just gone out this week, is a letter that was uh, put together by Drummond Woodsum of the law firm who we, who we work with, uh, talking about this issue and making sure it is very clear that it is not necessary for a parent to give permission for the Social Security number. One thing that the school board had an option for is to make any recommendation they have. And that night, the recommendation was made that the school units may include a statement that encourages, discourages, or is neutral about whether students should consent. That was added to this, uh, and we have, we're very clear again that parents do not have to do this. It is uh, their choice. There is a form on here for consent that they must send in, and that form of consent must be retained by us if there are ever any questions in the future. Uh, those, that information has just gone, uh, we went out at the end of last week. Uh, I, don't, I have not had a chance to begin to check to see what kind of responses we have had yet but uh, they should uh, be coming in. If there are responses to yes, they will do it. They should be coming in in the next few, few days. And so we will do a, do a uh, check by Friday of this week and Friday of next week to see what we are getting for information. 
Thank you, Alan. Okay, next is the nurses' vaccination update. What it did for you is, uh, several of you have asked me about vaccinations for this year. You remember last year we had a pretty formal process. Uh, we had to do several vaccinations. One was for H1N1, one was for seasonal vaccination. And for any child under 10, they had to have a double vaccination. And so some students had to have up to three. And those could be either by vaccination with a needle or uh, by uh, uh, breathe, what do you call it, breathing process. Uh, we have been checking with the state uh, this year. They are still supporting the idea of continuing the vaccination process. I have not approved that yet. Uh, I will be, I meet with the nurses on Friday mornings at seven o'clock in the morning. Any of you who likes to be up early would, would might love to join us. Uh, but what we are looking at is number one, H1N1 or any segment of that, whether it's now H1N1 or H2N5 or whatever it is, will, and seasonal, it will only be one vaccination. There will not be two or three vaccinations to go with it. We are looking at the possibility of doing the school systems. I have talked with fellow superintendents in Cumberland County, and most superintendents are moving ahead with this process. Last year, we did it during the school day and took students out of school. We did it for, on an emergency basis. Our look this year is to look at doing it at a different time, either after school or on Saturdays, and not disrupt the regular school day if and when we do it. We are also hearing, and we are waiting for confirmation on this, and that's what we're waiting for for Friday, that there will be more money available from the federal government to number one, help pay for substitutes for our nurses while we're doing this process, Number two, to help pay for the clinic planning, including the cost of all the materials that we need to have at that point in time. This past year, we had what I would say it was an amazing number of parent volunteers here in Cape Elizabeth, including several doctors and nurses who took the day off to come in and help us out. And I think I've spoken to you about this before, and I'll say it again. The nurses and all the volunteers just did an amazing job, and I was with them all three days uh, from morning until night just to see how it went and it went very, very well. Uh, this Friday, the nurses and I will be talking about this and uh, we are gathering some more information to determine whether we will move ahead. My sense is, in the long run, it is wise for us to move ahead to be sure as many students uh, receive this vaccination as possible. Uh, we again know we have both by needle and by the breathe-in model and so we are looking at it. We have also received uh, from the federal government a vaccine refrigerator, which is used to store our vaccine so we won't have to rent a place to keep it. Uh, we're looking at keeping it at the high school. Uh, it is, <laughs> I'm not real thrilled where it's gonna go, but it needs to go in a place which is hooked up to uh, the uh, generators that we have. And one of the most logical places, and Greg and I and the nurses have talked about this, is in the high school boiler room, uh, where it can also be monitored on a seven day a week basis, just in case it goes down, and so we're keeping all of that vac vaccine in there. We've also been in contact with SACOs, uh, visiting nurses, and they, if we do this, will be the people who will again come in and do the vaccinations for us. Uh, nurses prefer not to do the vaccine unless they absolutely have to, because it also sets a strategy if it's a kindergarten or a first or a second grader, sometimes scares them to death to know that the nurse will hold that needle. So uh, we are hoping to have SACO visiting health service come in and uh, do that work again for us if we do it. I will get back to you on the final plan uh, after probably this Friday and next Friday after we've checked into all of the pieces to the puzzle. Thank you. Any questions for Alan? Um, Alan, I just want to confirm with you that yes. this is being asked of all school districts yes. by the CDC. main CDC through, through the federal, through federal, federal CDC. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, moving on to staff leave of absence. We have one staff leave. This is an informational piece. We have a letter in here dated September 7, 2010 from Karen Dow, who is a grade one teacher at Farm Cove. Uh, she's expecting a child. Uh, she plans to take uh, the 12 weeks which are allowed by contract. <coughs> Depending on the baby's arrival, she should be out from around January 17th to April 8th. 
And uh, this again is informational for you. She is not requesting extra time or unpaid time for this. Great, thank you. Okay, and then Kathy, emergency preparedness. Yes, um, I'm the school board rep on the emergency preparedness committee mm -hmm. and we met on Friday, August 13th at uh, Alan's office. Um, the background for those who aren't familiar is that over the past two years there's been a committee working on a more comprehensive emergency preparedness plan for the Cape Elizabeth school system that reflects the expectations of the federal and state government. Plans for each building were instituted in 2005 and 2006 based on an earlier model but the more comprehensive plan began to evolve in 2008 and 2009. A committee of approximately 24 people from the town school system and the state met together to begin building a plan that would address as many known problems and to build a plan for the unknown. Um, the group we met with was a smaller group and we went over the um, current draft of the plan and there were some suggestions made on some changes. The plan is actually now over 200 pages. The individual school buildings have their own flip chart plan, I guess you'd call it, um, that they use um, currently. And somewhere along the way, when this plan is finished, we'll be bringing it to the board for review and approval. Um, there is a copy of the plan in the superintendent's office if any board members wish to look it over. Um, or if you wanted to see a school copy of that could be provided for you as well. Thank you, Kathy. Okay. The new business. Consideration of the 2010-11 France Exchange Trip Proposal from Cape Elizabeth High School. David, thank you so much for being so patient. <laughs> Would you like to come up? I've got three stack of papers. <laughs> I should mention for David's sake, I did not ask David to come to give a major presentation, so, okay. uh, but just to answer any questions. Okay. Also recognize that we have three board members who were not here last year. David has done this for several years. He's a, he's a pro at this. But I just turn on the tape, I'm good to go. You are ready to go. <laughs> but basically to be here to answer any questions you may have or any concerns that you may have. Kathy? Do we have uh, yet have the application for the trip? I have a write-up, but I don't have the you know the the application that we have, or am I missing it? No, no. I write. I don't see one. I have not made a application yet. Okay. 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 So, if there's no application, then what are we approving? I think uh, my sense is you can't. All of the information that is necessary okay. is here is in pretty good detail. Okay. As a matter of fact, much that we can use. And so this is probably a more specific understanding of what the trip would be than the, than the application that we normally do. Okay. All right. Um, is there a motion? Uh, I motion to approve uh, or to discuss the consideration of the 2010-2011 French Exchange trip proposal by, um, from Cape Elizabeth High School, uh, teacher David Perry. To approve, okay, thank you. Is there a second? A second. Thank you, Mary. Okay, any questions for David? Uh, I have a question. Is it, well, it's pretty basic. Uh, are we being asked to fund money, and if we are, mm -hmm. and that? Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? All those in favor? Seven zero. There you go. Thank you very much. Thank I'll you. Be, I will fill out that formal application. And you'll have it tomorrow. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Next. <clears throat> Excuse me. Seven B. Consideration to approve the um, nomination for 2010 Larry Allen for um, Point Two Choral Music at the high school. Is there a motion? <clears throat> I move that we approve the recommendation for Larry Allen as a point two choral music at the high school. Thank you, Linda. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, John. Discussion? Questions? All those in update. Is that a question? Yes, there's a question. Is this in the budget? Yes. No more questions. Any others? 
All those in favor? 7-0. <coughs> Excuse me again. Oh, Alan. <laughs> Consideration to approve the following extra and co-curricular staff nominations for 2010-11. Um, why don't we have a, well, yeah, why don't you go ahead and just okay. generally talk about what we're looking at here. What you have at the beginning is a list of the teachers who will be mentoring new staff. Uh, you remember I mentioned to you last time, we have a larger number of new staff than I ever expected. Uh, so uh, Mary uh, has m managed this process and she also put in here a summary of what that mentorship is all about and how it meets state law. The second part is middle school uh, athletic positions uh, in the, from tennis, soccer, boys and girls, cross country, field hockey, and tennis. I might add, I'm reading these off the agenda. If you want me to address any specific ones, I will. Uh, the third section is also middle school positions. Uh, they, uh, as you go down this, and I am going to have Steve speak to that for just a minute because you put a proposal as well. I'll have you come up in a minute, Steve. Uh, we also have high school William LeBlanc is the boys ice hockey coach. And I also have given you this evening this new sheet here, two sheets, which are uh, extracurricular positions at the high school. I uh, include Chris Newell as ninth grade class advisor, Tom Cohen, who is the 11th grade class advisor, and uh, and Tom Coyne, who is the senior to senior advisor, and Chris Newell, Gretchen McNulty, or SAC consultants. I do note on these uh, that uh, these are all new hires, and two of these are new positions. So I will ask also Jeff if he can speak to those. Uh, so those are the those are the things that I have that are for extra and co-curricular uh, pieces. What I would ask, uh, with your permission, Rebecca, mm -hmm. is to have Steve come up and speak to his positions first of all, okay. uh, and uh, how he has rearranged some of his positions to save some funding. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Uh, the document that uh, I'll be looking at the document that you have in the in the agenda packet. Um, we had a change. In, we, there was a request last year for funding from C for a civil rights team, a program that we had run uh, for several years, but had discontinued about three years ago. And the staff person who submitted that request uh, works in a different district this year. And in speaking with staff, I had a staff member come forward who would be interested in running a similar but different program, the Junior Model of the United Nations, which would follow along nicely with the model of the UN program at the high school. So I put a request in to see to allow those funds to be to uh, be repurposed. Um, in the student study team, we've revised and streamlined the process. Uh, instead of using the um, grade level representatives in grades, one for each grade level, five, six, seven, and eight, that are stipended positions for the student study team, Instead, we're using the uh, people who are working part-time in the response to intervention program and the instructional support staff uh, plus the school counselors to supervise that component. And by doing so, it saves something uh, off the top of my head. I forget it might be around $9,000. I have that in here somewhere. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, I'm not even close. The reduction of four positions from the SST saves $5,400, $1,350 for each of the four people. Um, the uh, our performance center director, Steve Price, has been asked to perform a number of services for each of the schools um, and for the community at large, whether it's for C functions, whether it's for uh, a high school event that was in the school last spring, or if it's for outside groups, or Ponco concerts, middle school concerts. We don't have, we have not had previously a position for performance center director, but considering the amount of technical assistance that was required now to maintain and to run the equipment that our drama program has um, bought, it, would, it, it doesn't work out well if we just say to folks, good luck, please don't break things, make sure you put them back, this is how you use this board, this is how you take care of this equipment, that's not working well. 
Um, the first easiest example of that is we go through, we, we, we were missing over the past two years like six different microphones. They, I don't know what it is about microphones, but they're, they're popular, I guess. So um, also, uh, Steve and previously Evan Solander found that the other equipment they, that they had would be improperly um, put back in the closets, uh, items are getting broken. So Steve just decided, okay, I'm just going to serve as this position. It's going to save us money, even though it's not a stipend position. Uh, no, and he clearly noted to me the amount that's paid out at the high school for the same position. Um, there are a number of other functions that occur at the high school, so it, it certainly is a proportion of what happens there. But the intent is to pay Steve as a performance center director for, his, for some of his time. It says 125 hours, of which that's not a good example of what he actually puts in. He did provide a log to me this past uh, spring, and spring is a busy time. Uh, that would demonstrate that if I moved that out over the year, he'd be over 175 hours. Um, the, so that would be a total stipend of $1,750. Uh, that would be a reasonable um, amount for Steve to make sure that he's available for functions. He gets asked at, it, it, it could be 10 minutes before something when somebody says, well, by the way, I need, a, I, need, I need a mic. I need to be able to do this. I need to be able to do that. He's still working on helping people with timing, but uh, at least his uh, frustrations would be a little less difficult for him, I'm sure. Um, for one of, we, we used to have a school newspaper, and the school newspaper, because of all the information that's produced on the blogs and the kids' creative writings and things like this have, uh, are posted as well, we've really seen a drop off of the number of kids who want to take the time to be on a school newspaper. It was uh, Adam Killebrand for a couple of years and Carrie Newton. Both of them found that during the year that the numbers would drop to about two kids, two to three kids, and they'd be kids that they'd have to go to and say, you are coming tonight, right? Please come. <laughs> I haven't got many others to rely on. So um, we decided to move away from the school newspaper. Uh, Gwyneth McGuire and Hannah Roner approached me about the possibility of adding a news crew uh, team for the for, uh, which would replace some of the tech team things that used to occur in the school as well. So it sounded like a really nice mix between some of the technology aspects we've had in the past for clubs and then some of the uh, opportunities for kids to have different audiences to hear their ideas. So um, this request uh, would be for, it, it's hoped that it would reach a, create a niche for a different dynamic of students as well provide more kids with different opportunities. Um, and the stipends, the, the new club would pay a, to, uh, a total of $840 in stipends, so $420 apiece. Uh, item number five talks about an environmental club. That was actually started last year by about maybe 10 to 12 eighth graders and one seventh grader. And they kind of ran unofficially throughout the year and, and did some work on composting. And, uh, and, and provided uh, uh, literature around the school for students and, and uh, also did some fundraising for activities uh, to pay for recycle bins or composting bins. Um, this year I've again been approached by a couple of kids who are interested in doing this. I've been approached by staff as well to say, look, there is an interest. We know that if we put it back out there, we'll get more kids. Even Andrew Holliday's now at the high school has contacted me already to say, I'm ready to come back and get this kicked off. When can we meet? So uh, there certainly is a, a push, um, which is a great one, because it comes directly from kids. And I think that that would be a successful club. Uh, Laura Ellis has volunteered to uh, supervise that. She's our, uh, res uh, our response to intervention and executive functioning service provider for grades 7 and 8. Um, also, Amanda Kozakar, a new librarian, her husband works on the um, recycling, composting, environmental club work in another school system, has a lot of resources. She's going to share those, and we have a parent who has volunteered to work with the group as well. So if you look at the total numbers of this, uh, between what was saved in the SST and the other costs that would be 
incurred here, it would actually be a reduction of $2,570 to provide, I think, better services for the school and for the students. Thank you, Steve. Right. Just a quick question about your news team. Are they going to have cameras, or are, they, are you thinking? Yes, thanks and, for asking that. Okay. So it would be actually like uh, turning on Channel 6, hopefully. <laughs> I don't know about the blue screen. But. And are the cameras, or do we own the cameras already? Well, we, we purchased um, two, I'm trying to think, uh, flip cameras. Uh -huh. So we have those, and those take video segments. We also have... Um, we also have a, a, a fairly low-grade tech kind of uh, camera for them to use, camcorder. Okay. So, and then there's also on the uh, laptops themselves, they have recordable capabilities. So we have some things that we'll try out. We're not interested in saying, you know, this first go-around, let's, let's see what we can spend. Right. So, uh, I think there's plenty of technology opportunities. Uh, will there be better equipment out there? Yes. Do we need it this year? Probably not. I was just curious. Thank you. So well, I think that would be a really interesting thing for kids to say. I never tried something like that. Who knows? It could spur, uh, spur a career. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you're funding this by, uh, it's obviously budget neutral or budget positive, but you're eliminating four SSTs. What's the cost of that? By cost, I mean, we had them in the budget, so we assumed that they were important. Why are they not important anymore that we can eliminate? Well, there's, what we did was we moved um, we, with the addition of the executive functioning position and the response to intervention job that Laura Ellis does in the 7th and 8th grade. We actually determined that this year we would move the meeting time to during the school day, which made things a little bit more complex for us. And so we tried to brainstorm around that about, well, how do we... Uh, because these teachers need the opportunity, people who case manage students, they need the time to go to team meetings, they need the time to take care of the paperwork, to be the liaison between the school and the families, um, and to also keep tabs and, and to do the updates and sometimes do some of the, the assessment probes so we can do progress monitoring with these kids. Um, what we were finding is that uh, Gretchen McCloy and Kim Sturgeon would frequently, that, that during the school year last year, teachers would say, you know, the kids aren't here, I can't do the program with them because it's after school hours and I don't have that free time. Or um, the information, information that they needed for other te from other teachers was kind of difficult. If a teacher was coaching a, a sport or working with a club and they couldn't access them. So we were trying to brainstorm how do we look to improve the opportunities for communication? And the two or three different pieces just seem to come together as though this will work out better. So when, I, I guess to summarize, you don't believe that you need to, in order to provide the same service, you can provide the same service without four SSDs? Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, yeah, I have a, uh, sorry, we have to hear. I don't, Jeff, uh, as far as your extracurricular positions, particularly Tom Cohen is senior, senior and Chris Newell of Richard and now the SAC consultant. I think you talked about that before, but could you just mention them quickly as they're both new positions and new hires? Yeah, I mentioned the SAC positions. There were three that the school board approved in the budget process last year. I have two teachers who have stepped forward to do two of the committees. I'm still searching for the third person. I think I may have found him today, uh, but that's that's go down the road. Um, Tom Cohan is for the senior to senior program, which some of you may remember uh, grew out of a incident at the high school several years ago, um, and it involves senior our seniors working with senior citizens in the community. Um, and last year, uh, a local business, um, Paula Banks' um, social work business, which w whose specialty is working with elderly folks in the Cape community, uh, very generously stepped forward and said, I'd be glad to fund a stipend uh, to support that. So there is no cost to the budget for this position, but because it's a position that would be working with our students through an organized program, um, it's being submitted um, for approval. And Tom is very excited to do it. Thank you.
Okay, I, I'm, I'm sorry, Jeff. Did you say that one of these positions is not in our budget? In the, the, the senior to senior position oh. uh, is being funded entirely right. by a private donation. Other than that, all these positions were already in our budget? Yes. yes. Thank you. Yep. Right, so um, I would like to suggest that we approve this en masse and um, ask a board member to make a motion, please. Should I just ask for approval as a slate? Okay. As presented. Um, I move that we approve the following extra and co-curricular staff nominations for the year 2010 and 11 um, as presented. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Kate. Questions or discussion? Linda? Actually, Janet, I was wondering if you could give me some idea of the middle school students that were here earlier this evening were talking about enrollment in the middle school athletics programs. Can you give us a comparison uh, to last year as far as where those mm -hmm. off the top of your head without? <laughs> I know you're not prepared for this. <laughs> That's just me. I apologize. Change can be, oh no, but well, <laughs> <laughs> the mantra. <laughs> um, they are about the same, um, although we, our promise for online registration by September 1st for middle school athletics, I think, is through a few people for a loop, and so they, we are still receiving registrations as we speak. Well, so that's a good thing. It is. So, they're showing a pretty steady increase in the enrollments. No, uh, not an increase. I think it's about the same. It's just that um, they're coming in a little slower because of the timeline that we set. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Yep. David? I had a question for Steve. I was going to catch him before he, he sat down, but he sat down. Um, I always have these questions about middle school sports because I think they're very important. Um, and I vaguely remember having this discussion last year as part of the budget process. I noticed it's just seventh and eighth grade teams. Were there ever sixth grade teams or fifth grade teams? Was that done through community service? There are sixth graders who can participate in some middle school sports. For the most part, the middle school sports are, they're, they're almost primarily for seventh and eighth graders up until sixth, through sixth grade. Most of them are through the community services. We have uh, kids in the sixth grade, for instance, if we, ha it depends on our numbers that we can take kids on in track, indoor track, we could take them on in um, swimming, for instance. So, but as an example, last year, our numbers in swimming, we had about 60 kids in the pool at one time in the seventh and eighth grade. We, we, didn't, we weren't able to take sixth graders on as well. But that's, that's an agreement in the Triple C League that if the numbers allow it, and we have kids who want to participate, they can. But otherwise, like six, fifth and sixth are done through community service? Yes. yes. Um, are there, again, the A and B teams? Um, did we have that before, and do we have that now? Do you remember, la you remember last year, we didn't have the funding for the, th for the we, we had previous, in previous years, we had funding for up to three B teams if needed. Uh, last year, we didn't have that enough funding. That's back in for this year came in in the midpoint mm -hmm. budget. So we have, I don't know, I think it was $5,400, something like that, for three, up to three stipended positions for B team coaches. And it's, if we get, for instance, my guess is the eighth grade baseball this year and eighth grade basketball uh, could see a, a large number of signups because that's what happened last year in the seventh grade. So, but depending on the sport and the need, that's our plan. But right now, for the fall sports, it looks as if you don't need any B team. Uh, I saw the numbers recently, but um, I thought the numbers were okay. Janet, did you notice anything unusual in the numbers for the fall? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? <coughs> I have a question about the the mentor. The, the one thing I don't think we've touched on is the other mentor stipends. Um, can, can, I guess, Alan, because yeah. this addresses all three schools, uh, uh, um, can you just speak to um, 
what, what this mentoring process is. I guess I was put off a little bit by that. I, I'm sure there's a great, um, there's, there's great things happening here. Maybe I was put off a little bit by the language that, on this memo, which says, as required by state law, um, because uh, I'm sure we're not spending this money just because of the requirement of state law and that, we're, that, 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 there are, that there is a good program with thinking behind it. Can you speak sure. to that a little bit? Thank you. What happened was uh, Mary was here, I think, was that in the spring and talked about this to some extent? And so I'll just go back to some of the things that she said. Several years ago, uh, the uh, certification and therefore the work process with teachers was handled through the state. Uh, it has changed now, so it is handled through local uh, government. And so we provide the mentor process for each one of these. So I think it was three years ago, Mary, uh, Shari Robinson, and I think the, they were the first two who were trained to begin to train mentors in this process. So through the rules, and you'll find that there's also a connected uh, document that shows what the rules are from the state. Uh, what we have to do is, the first two years that a teacher is new in the system, we must provide them a mentor. And it, so therefore, we have trained all of these teachers you see, Janet Amberger, Joyce Bell, et cetera, to be mentors. And so they are assigned to our new teachers to do that work. The only person that you'll see as a new teacher who does not have a mentor here is our new choral teacher because he's only here one fifth time. So Mary will be doing that on her own just to make sure that that's covered. But these are, these are set, John, uh, based on what state law has required, but also what we do, have chosen to do when the, when the agreement was established to provide a mentor for each of these people. So some of them you look at, like for instance, I look at very quickly, Tatiana Green and Joni Hewitt, who are in their second year here. And then I look at quite a few of these who are in their first year here. And so they, re they have those mentors working with them. The mentors have been specifically trained and therefore they have specific things they look for in the teaching process and they do write reports uh, and do work with these people on a regular basis to be sure that they are beginning to understand the process of teaching within the system. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Kathy? Um, I just wanted to add, John, that it's my fault that it says state required because when we, <laughs> when we did the agenda, I recall that in the past, sometimes when we've put things down like mentor, um, we've had some folks um, question why we did it. So I suggested that we add that it was state required so that it was clear, not realizing that it might send it over the other side. So <laughs> I just want to take responsibility for that. That's okay. It's a good opportunity to, to hear have the more conversation. About it. Sure. Can I ask for one clarification? The, these are new teachers. These are not experienced teachers coming from another district. Is that correct? In many cases, they're brand new teachers. Some of them are coming in from another district. But when they become a new teacher in Cape Elizabeth, we provide them that mentor process so that they learn how to work in Cape Elizabeth schools as teachers. For instance, if you look at these again, Joni Hewitt has come in here. She taught in South Portland before this. And she came in a year ago as our ELL teacher. So she has this mentor, and this is the second year. Uh, Tatiana Green came in from a system in Vermont. But because she's a new teacher in Cape Elizabeth, she receives that mentor uh, training and support. Then you have people, uh, Nancy Carroll is another one. Nancy Carroll has been here for quite a few years as Ned Tack, but this is her first year as a classroom teacher. And so she receives the mentor process with that. Uh, I know Heather Geike, who uh, is, has sued Mishu. Heather has taught in other systems, but she's a brand new teacher so, here in Cape. So I I'm just want clarification this. So the state requires, just be, even though a teacher may have 10 years experience, if they could show up at Cape, we have to pay for a mentor for two we years for them? We a mentor for them, yes. OK. Mind-boggling, but right. OK. Any other um, questions? All those in favor? Thank you. OK. Uh, consideration to uh, approve a tax exempt lease purchase agreement uh, for school bus. Kathy, do you want to speak to this? Yep. As you will see in your packets, um, Pauline has provided for us a school bus purchase information, and I will read it. 
The purchase of a new school bus was approved through the budget process for 1011 with funding for one third of the cost included in the transportation budget. We participated in the state school bus purchasing program bidding process to receive the best possible price on a 2011 international 77 passenger integrated body conventional school bus. The total purchase price is $85,782. A municipal lease purchase proposal was requested from three local banks, Gorham Savings Leasing Group, LLC, Key Government Finance, Inc., and TD Equipment Finance, Inc. The low bidder was Gorham Savings Leasing Group, LLC, with a 2.98% fixed interest rate for a total interest payment of $2,530.92 over three years. Um, we have um, Pauline's recommendation, so I would like to um, make a motion to approve a tax-exempt lease purchase agreement with Gorham Savings Leasing Group, LLC, for a school bus with a purchase price of $85,782. Um, and the, there is language in here, but I'm not going to read all of it. Second. Thank you. Kathy and Linda. Yep. Questions, discussion? Just so I'm clear that we're paying $85,072 plus interest of $2530. Is that correct? Thank you. Any other questions? All those in favor? 7-0. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Pauline. I guess I'll do this one. <laughs> Item 7E is a consideration to appoint a school board member as delegate to the MSBA which is the main school business board association's annual assembly taking place on Thursday, October 21st, 2010. Um, I would like to note to the board members that in the past this has been held um, uh, at the same time as the, um, the teacher, conferences. teacher conferences, but this year it's not, which should hopefully maybe open up people's availability. Um, I would, I see a natural, um, link to, to our legislative liaisons as potential candidates um, because oftentimes what the uh, assembly discusses is resolutions about upcoming um, educational issues in the state of Maine. Uh, we are going to need to know, mm, sorry, just based on when we need to give that, October 8th. So we need to submit this by October 8th. I encourage everybody to think about whether they would like to um, be a delegate um, and to let me know. Um, do we need to vote? Uh, you will have to eventually vote on who's going to be representative. Yeah, and our next meeting will not be in time. So perhaps we could have a volunteer this evening. I'll volunteer. David, thank you. Okay, so um, I'd like to move that the school board um, appoint David Hillman as our delegate to the MSBA's annual assembly taking place on Thursday, October 21st, 2010. Is there a second? No, second. Thank you, Mary. Questions, discussion? Thank you very much, David, for volunteering. All those in favor? 7-0. Can I just mention to David that the forms have just come in today for signing up for the different sessions that are on that day. So if you get in contact with Andrea, she'll get that to you. I think there's like 50 different possibilities for you to choose from. So you should have asked a question before the <laughs> volunteer, I think. That's why I didn't say a word. <laughs> Becca, can I ask a question? Um, if there is a, uh, a scheduling issue, do we need a backup person? Uh, just possibly. You know, scheduling. Yeah. I don't know if now's the time. Yeah. Oh, so you volunteer to be the our, second. Our, the alternate. Alternate. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Kate. Okay. And I do believe that the, that all board members are invited to attend um, the MSBA fall Convention. conference. Fall conference. Yeah. Yeah. But that is also, that is the week of the teacher conferences, so it tends to be a harder time for parents um, to go. Okay, so thank you, Kate and David. Okay, moving on to item 
7F, which is consideration to add Latin. A Latin position for levels two and three. Thank you. For 30 minutes for four days per week. Uh, if I can just mention it briefly, yes. uh, I found out this past year something I had not known, and that was the fact that we have been offering these positions, these courses before school starts. Uh, we grade them, either pass or fail, and parents are asked to pay for those, which is an illegal process in doing that, because if you're grading them, they are a school course. So Jeff and I have talked a lot about this, and Mort has been in contact with us. I think this is the third letter that I have received from him so far and looking at it. When we discussed the federal jobs bill the other night, the other night you remember I brought uh, this to you and you said you would prefer that we come back to you when we know numbers and names. So I have this together and I would ask Jeff if he would like to speak to this. Jeff and I have met on this at least twice if not three times uh, to figure out just what we might do with this process. I guess I should start by saying I was aware that this was happening and I didn't, I was not sensitized to the issues with it that, um, that it apparently raises. But um, Mort So, who's our Latin One teacher who's been teaching at the high school for a bunch of years, um, um, since his position got cut down and uh, we've just never been able to get the numbers to offer Latin Two and Three through the program of studies uh, because of scheduling constraints largely that students face. He has done this for the last few years, um, offering Latin 2 and 3 as an independent study. This year he's scheduled to have eight students in Latin 2 and five students in Latin 3. Um, I've talked to Mort. Um, he does do, it's a total of two hours a week. Um, and talking about it with Pauline, sort of the rationale for how we got to the number that's indicated on this memo, it's essentially taking as a teacher's full-time hours, the number that's typically used, which is 35 hours a week, taking two hours, dividing that by 35, you get it come up with 5.71% um, of a teacher of Wart's, what would be his full-time salary if he were a full-time teacher, that works out to $4,034. So that's where that number comes from. It would allow him, um, since the arrangement he's done for the past few years raises some issues that we hadn't appreciated, uh, to be able to continue to offer that opportunity for students. Thank you. Any questions for Jeff? Kathy? Question, does this mean it will now be a graded class, or will it still be pass-fail? It's still pass-fail. It's still an independent study, and the, honestly, the contact time is not such that I would feel comfortable offering it as if it were a full graded class, but it is reflected on the transcript as independent study, Latin 2 or Latin 3, depending on which level it is. Thank you. How, how do you look at Latin as, as in terms of your thinking about producing a, a, a small but comprehensive high school? Is, is Latin 2 and 3 uh, is, is, is it critical to that? Is, can you talk to that a little bit? Is it critical to it? I'm not sure it's critical to it, but is it a really nice addition for students? Um, it certainly has a, a very traditional place in, in American curriculum. Um, certainly it has become, in the last 10 years or so, it's become, it's, it's, reach, it's on its return wave, sort of, to American public education. So I would say increasingly it is beginning to be viewed by parents and by, uh, and by students that way. Uh, it's a great opportunity for kids to be able to have. I completely support it if the board is, is willing to and able to do it this way. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity. Um, so, yeah. I, there was something else I was going to say and I just blanked out on it, John. Uh, maybe it'll come uh, I, I'm thinking, I'm thinking about the Mandarin program which did not survive the budget process last right. year, which was more, was more expensive than Latin 2 and 3 combined, um, but not a lot more expensive. Um, and, and in fact, um, before Al and I had this conversation that leads to this proposal about Latin 2 and 3, I'd actually already set up a, a meeting and Vivica Kwan and I met um, last week um, and she's looking at some creative possibilities for potentially being able to continue to offer Mandarin in some form. Again, just appreciate that the reason Latin 2 and 3 and the reason Latin and Mandarin have, were cut 
is not because of any judgment about the value of them. It's just that students haven't been that enough students have not signed up to take the classes um, because um, most typically they want to take it. They don't want to drop their French and Spanish courses in order to take it, and it just results practically in a it's it's, it's just a schedule impossibility for most kids. Particularly if there are students who are also taking band at the same time, it becomes it does become literally impossible, particularly in ninth and tenth grade. Jeff, uh, a typical foreign language um, class is how many hours a week? Uh, it would be 200 minutes, so about three and a half hours a week. Three and a half hours. So yeah. this is less than a typical. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. and this is combining two levels. No, it's two separate classes. I understand. I'm but sorry. Two hours a week would be. I, I'm adding up all Correct. 30 minutes. Two hours yes. a week of two different levels is still less than what a full. Okay. Which is why I'm not comfortable sort of treating it as as if it's a regular classroom, just offered in a creatively a, in a scheduling way and, and and grading it as if it were the same thing because it's not. I mean, obviously. The classes do tend to be smaller, so you can carry more ground. And obviously, the students who self-select to come in at 7.15 in the morning, um, two days a week, are sort of very highly motivated to do this. So um, so you can certainly cover more ground than you could in this amount of time in most situations. Okay. Question for, for Jeff? No, I'd rate yes. OK, I'm just confirming because we will discuss. If I understand, how many people do we have? I have the same concern that John does, that Mandarin was cut. And we're now, after the budget process, sticking something back in, assuming we have the money. I, I see a total of 11 people. 13. 13. Um, how many people do we have in Mandarin? Uh, from my conversations, five students signed up for Mandarin for this year. And what Vivica is doing, and I'm working with her as well, is to see how many, if any of them, would be interested in a similar arrangement. Vivica is also considering the possibility of, of possibly putting together a SEEF grant to see if she can do something um, creatively for Mandarin. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I just would go back to David's question. It is 11. Uh, there are eight in two, and there are th uh, three in three. Mm -hmm. Then I must, this is the list I've got here, anyway. It's eight. What Mort explained to me is eight, eight in two and five in three. That's great. Well, that's, that's the that's list he sent to us. Hmm. Okay. I assume my math was just bad. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's... Okay, any more questions for Jeff? Can we have a motion, please? I move, I'll make the motion. Um, I move that we approve Latin's level two and three. Um, okay, is there a second? A second. Thank you, Kate. Discussion? Could I ask that we, we also approve that for the fiscal year 10 and 11 only? That's what I was wondering, for fiscal year 10 and 11. If you want to okay. Thank you. Discussion? Okay. Um, am I right to think from our last teaching learning workshop, I think we picked this up, was that we are coming into regulations by paying this teacher, and that's the reason why this has come back. Exactly. If, if once I found out that parents are being asked to give money afterwards yes. and they are receiving a grade, even though it's a pass-fail grade, that is illegal. Yes. And so we can't do that. So if you don't approve this, then I will not approve the two and three programs because I don't want to put us into a position of doing this illegally, even though it has been done that way for a couple, three years. Yes. Mm. And the parents did petition for this to continue on after it was cut. Um, I remember. Was that, that was a couple of years ago, wasn't it? Several the petition? Ago. Yeah, yeah. Several, yeah. So the interest has always. Has yeah, we had, uh, the year the petition went out, if I remember that correctly, we had a fairly long list of petitioners. Uh, but then when it came down to making the selection of taking two and three, as opposed to some of the other courses that were there, they just couldn't do it. And so then the numbers dropped drastically. 
And that's what does happen if you try to do it during the regular school day. Mm -hmm. And so this is why it's done early prior to school starting. Mm -hmm. I think we should be very um, proud that our school has the band issue, band versus Latin, and our students are still <laughs> taking band. And it's a great um, credit to the school system. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Any other discussion? Um, I'll, I'll tell you my opinion. My opinion is this was not in the budget. It's not what we approved. We cut another position, and we have to have some integrity to the budget process. I, I, I have nothing against Latin 1, 2, and 3. I think, actually think that they're, it's what I do for a living, they're excellent courses. But I, my personal view is there's no reason why this, this should come in the back door when we cut one in the front door. We didn't do this one in the front door. So unless I'm misunderstanding it. That's my view. John. So, well, since I got David started, I'll, I'll rebut him. Um, <laughs> we're not, this isn't, this isn't a matter of, I don't think of this coming in, the, in through the back door. This is, as Kate pointed out, um, the, 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 we expected last year when we passed the budget that we, we had a curriculum that included Latin two and three. Um, that, but that was funded in a different, that was available to the students who wanted to take it, but funded in a different way. And funded in a way that it turns out we can't, we cannot continue to fund it. So while we weren't funding it, we were expecting it to be a part of our curriculum. So I, so I look at this a little bit differently, which is that the funding source for Latin 2 and 3, which we expected to be part of the curriculum, is no longer available to us. I, I would agree with you, but the problem is we didn't vote for the money. Now, you're assuming that if we had a chance to vote, we would approve $4,000. No, I, we, we now have a chance to vote, so. Well, I'm just saying you're assuming that we would have approved 4000 I, I'm of the view that we'll never know. And it wasn't approved. It's, that's just my view. I would like to remind you, David, and, and other board members that we just approved a week ago, um, adding back in. Uh, one and a half positions in instructional support that were not approved in our budget. Based so, on federal money that came from a third party source than our taxpayers. That's the reason why I voted for that. This is coming from our taxpayers. Well, Am I correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. okay. So that's a difference to me, a major difference to me. Okay. Any further discussion? Questions? Okay. All of those in favor? All those opposed? Do you the, so it's one of five, two. five to two. Yeah. Oops, I wrote <coughs> the wrong place. Okay. Um, last business item is consideration to approve the girls' cross country trip to Ocean State Invitational. This, this request has just come in recently. Uh, unfortunately, Jeff Thorek isn't here, and I thought he could speak to it. I don't know if, uh, Jeff, I know you've read it and approved it, so could you speak to this trip? I think it's one we've had on the agenda for several years. So. This is either the third or fourth year in a row um, where students have been invited uh, to attend this opportunity. Uh, it is entirely funded if the board approves it by Den Delta Dental uh, through a contribution that they're making. There is no cost to the school district. Um, there are more than adequate chaperones. Um, the students, in order to be able to attend the event, the students uh, they do have to miss a, a couple of hours of school, which is or three hours of school, which is always unfortunate. It would be nice to be able to do it without it at all, but they cut it as closely as they can and still allow the students to participate. Any questions for Jeff? How come it's only women? Uh, you know, I think it's because the last couple of years in particular, I think um, our, our girls have shown on a statewide basis. Um, and, and last year they were the state champions in the, in the last two or three years. Our boys are extremely competitive, breeds, <laughs> very competitive, and they, were, they have been invited in the past as well. So in other words, this is an invitation only, yes. not like we apply? That's correct. But it is, but it is, I don't want to say this word because I know it's not correct, but it is a male-female event. I mean, yes, yes, it is. There are, there, my understanding is there are, it is not strictly a girls' event. But, okay, yeah. thank you. Any other questions for Jeff? We have a motion, please. 
I move that we approve the girls' cross-country trip to the Ocean State Invitational uh, Friday, September 24th and Saturday, September 25th. Second. John, I didn't even get to ask. Okay, uh, any discussion? All those in favor? 7 zero. Okay. Um, committee reports? Um, can I just mention the school board coffees? Um, the communications committee will be, um, well, on behalf of the communications, will be hosting school board um, coffees for teachers um, um, Tuesday mornings starting next week. Next week we start in the middle school. Um, it'll be prior to school. All teachers are invited. We hope to have a critical mass of school board members there for meet and greet that will be followed. Um, the following Tuesday will be Pond Cove and finishing up with the high school at the first Tuesday of October. So. Thank you, Mary. And the committee reports? Okay. Uh, school board agenda requests? I'm sorry. I skipped public comment on non-agenda items. That's okay. School board agenda requests? Uh, announcement of upcoming meetings. Uh, I'll just refer the public to the website where all meetings are posted. Do I have a motion for adjournment? So moved. Thank you, Linda. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. All those in favor? 10-0. Thank you, everyone.